welcome the MP for East Hall, Carl Turner. Can you please welcome British Graham Stewart, MP Thanks, for Beverly and Holmes. <laughs> The first student in which we're going to have asking a question is Gareth Copeland, who's studying an extended diploma in health and social care. Uh, the future curriculum in secondary schools is likely to have fewer vocational elements now that it is proposed the vocational qualifications are worth less in the school league tables. What is your view on the status that should be given to the vocational qualifications? I think it's an important issue at the moment, especially uh, now that we have a new government, because I suspect Michael Gould, the Secretary of State for Education's opinions in this area are a lot different to the previous Secretary of State. Uh, there's been a, a report out recently, I think the author of that was Alison Wolfe, and she uh, examines this very issue. My view is that it's very important to it's very important to have vocational qualifications and I think you know if people are naturally capable of academic subjects and they're going to be doing well at academia great we should encourage that but I also think vocational subjects are just as important um, and I'm not entirely sure I agree with some of what Alison Wolfe says in the report although I accept I've not read it all I suspect Graham Stewart has given that he's the chair of the Education Select Committee in Parliament in the House of Commons. But I think she, she hits the nail on the head with some of it. Some of it I think she's got wrong, badly wrong. But if I'm absolutely honest, I can't remember which parts I think she got particularly badly wrong. I agree. And what have you got to say on the matter? Um, I'm not sure that necessarily we are going to see fewer vocational qualifications because of the change. What the situation was that you had these equivalences so that certain courses were given um, were given the value of two or even three GCSEs and the perception was that people were being put onto certain courses not because it would be good for them but because it would be good for the institution that they were attending. It would make it easier for the school to say oh we've got five good GCSEs. The important thing is that people do something of value that gets them somewhere in life. What I'd like to see change at the moment a secondary school is measured almost entirely on how it does on five good GCSEs. And there's a lot of people who've got no chance of getting five good GCSEs. You can look at where they get to at the end of primary school, and very, very few people who don't get to level four at primary school get five good GCSEs. So schools have no incentive to focus on the people who are um, uh, lower attaining at that level. And it's just as important to move someone from, a, from a, 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 an E to a D as it is to move someone from a D to a C. So I think we need to change the system of measurement for secondary schools we need to make sure that things like a destination, where you end up, if we can find decent measures for that, will become more of a driver of behaviour. Because if a school can end up with everyone who leaves it, going on either in education or getting a good job, then it's, to my mind, it's succeeded. If it gets good GCSEs for some kids, quite a high percentage, but others end up on the dole, going nowhere, it's failed. So what we need is a balanced scorecard for schools that gives equal weight to the progress of every child and means that vocational qualifications, whether you're good at academia or not, are available, are given value, and can provide people with the skills they need in order to get, a, get and hold down a job. You've got some good points there. Carl, is there anything from that you'd like to follow up? Or... I think it's probably safe to say I agreed with the vast majority of what Graham said there. My only concern is, and I, I suspect Graham might want to, to comment on this, is it seems to me, as a Labour Member of Parliament, when I look at Michael Gove and what I think the government agenda is, it seems slightly hypocritical, if I'm honest, because what it seems to say on one hand is free schools should be choose to do as you like, you know, get on with it, total uh, uh, autonomy, great stuff, we'll leave you to it, but on the other hand it's, hang on a minute, we're going to force certain schools to teach certain subjects, and I just it, that that does concern me a bit. If I'm absolutely honest, Andy. Well, just uh, the free schools and academies are not obliged to follow the national curriculum, and there's quite a lot of effort going into developing a new national curriculum at exactly the same time as the government is urging every school uh, seems to be pushing a lot of schools to become academies and thus free from it. And I can see that there is a certain incoherence in that. Well, that's nice. We've got agreement from two rival politicians. Um, 
Okay. Oh. Right, okay, we'll move on to the second question then. Um, this will come from Alexandra Noble, who is studying A-levels in chemistry, English literature, French, and maths. The government officials and teachers all seem to have a say in what is taught in the curriculum. We believe that the content should be interesting and enjoyable. Do you believe that young people's views are important in shaping the curriculum? Right, should we go to you first, Rowan, for this one? Um, yeah, well, certainly, all well, young people should get to choose, and there should be a broad and balanced curriculum. Everybody agrees on that, so that um, young people, informed by parents and by schools, and hopefully uh, careers guidance professionals, can make their choice. So I think it's a, a mix. I, I think you want to uh, young people obviously would have a, a say in what subjects they take. I'm not really aware of many young people who do GCSEs that they don't want to do. They um, they uh, they get to choose, and, uh, and I hope that would continue. Uh, as to, in terms of the curriculum, the aim is that it should be broad and balanced so that um, people can then choose from a, a variety of different things. Of course, one of the benefits of a college like this, uh, of this size, is that you get a decent choice of subjects. Um, and it can be an issue with some school six forms that their school persuades you to stay on, and then there's a rather a narrow set of options at the school. And, uh, I think it needs to be very, very good at those narrow set of options for young people to be better served by a school like that than by a college like this. Um, you've been quoted before as saying, uh, if my research is correct, that the only term of education that you enjoyed before university was the last. Was there anything that you didn't particularly enjoy that you've seen changed, or is there anything that, um, if you could go back, you'd want to see changed? Well, I was at an all-male <laughs> Scottish boarding school. It didn't start well. Uh, 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 I, I'd probably... You, uh, maybe I painted overly black. I probably enjoyed some of it, um, but uh, what's changed since? Well, I've been back to the school I was at once, and they've certainly done it up now. I, I don't believe there's ice on the walls, on the inside of the walls in the bedrooms anymore. So um, maybe it's got a bit more comfortable. Good stuff, um, Carl. Um, same question. Yeah. Um... I think it's very important for students to be involved in choosing the subjects they're going to be studying. I'm not entirely sure whether, when I think back to when I was sort of 13 and I was going into secondary school as it was then, whether I'd be a good judge of what I should be uh, studying, to be honest. I think I'd probably got it wrong. I didn't do very well at school anyway, if I'm absolutely honest. I left at 16 without any O levels at all. So. I'm probably not the, the best person to be commenting on this. But I think you know, I think it's very important for students to be involved in, in choosing courses, but I don't think they should be involved too much in choosing what the curriculum is going to be across the board. Because as I say, if it was me choosing all those years ago, I'd have probably got it wrong, if I'm honest. You know, it's got to be a balance. It's got to be about what's necessary for the economy and jobs, um, you know, and, and what suits the individual as well. Did they talk to students about the future of the curriculum? Well, there's an expert group led by Tim Oates, who's an academic from Cambridge Assessment, which is the master body of the Oxford and Cambridge OCR examination body, and there's a whole bunch of people there, including heads and others. Uh, I would imagine that they would um, talk to uh, students as well, but the consumers, if you like, when you when people come out of college and school and university, they're having to the, to go to employers. So having employer involvement to help uh, communicate what employers want is also important. I mean, we are uh, struggling in Europe to be competitive globally. China is coming up, India is coming up, uh, South America is doing strongly. We need to have the only way we're going to be able to compete is if we've got the right skill sets. So uh, I, I hope the, uh, the curriculum is, is hearing from universities, employers, as well as young people to get it right. Because if we don't get it right, then there's absolutely nothing in history that tells you because you've been a great power at some point and a successful economy at some point, that you're necessarily going to stay there. Yeah. And the idea that we've got some divine right to be a relatively rich and successful country, we haven't. Yeah. Um, there are very, very poor countries that used to be rich, yeah. and we could easily be one of them if we don't get our education right, which is why, that's why I find it a great privilege to be involved in education, because what we do, the decisions we make on things like curriculum, on the incentives that drive behaviour in schools, the choices people make, 
will have implications for decades to come because the education you get now is going to determine your opportunities and how well you do going forward. And collectively, for all of us, that adds up to whether we're a successful economy that's growing and getting stronger and can pay for the public services we want, or is in fact going backwards and can't. Well then, okay, we'll move on to the third question. This is going to come from Daniel Farmer, who is studying A-levels in politics, English language, and English literature. And tuition fees have risen, and we're in a recession. Is it worth going to university, or should we just go and get a job instead? Who'd like to say this first cut back to Carl? If you wish. Yeah, um, Daniel. Where were you, Daniel? Hi, Daniel. Um, look, it's always very important to go on to education, whatever level that is, in my view. I went to university at 29, I think I was. It wasn't too late for me. It was probably one of the best things I ever did, if I'm honest. So I would always encourage people to go on to university. It's a matter of choice. It must be, if I'm honest, um, something that puts you off. What is it going to be? It's 9,000 quid a year now. 27 grand. I'm not very good at maths. I think that's right. Um, before you even think about getting a job, possibly have to go on and spend more money even after committing to 27 grand if you've got to do an extra qualification such as teaching or something else. I did the bar vocational course to train as a barrister. I think that course now is £16,000. You know, there is no possibility whatsoever that I could have done that um, now, if I'm honest. I just wouldn't have had the cash to be able to do it. So it must put people off. Um, I think Graham is shaking his head, so I suspect he's going to be disagreeing with me. I think it really is off-putting to people. When they're looking Most of at you said you wouldn't be able to do it because you didn't have the cash. You don't need any cash. Well, you I'm don't have to pay a penny up front. Well, well, it's actually, all done on, you have to earn more than 21000 before you pay. I think that might be a Unless you get a good job, in, in a you don't have to pay anything. Right, the, reality, reality, gonna put the, you off. the reality is that tuition fees are £9,000 a year. That's uh, £27,000. As I said, I'm not very good at maths. I think I got that one right. Um, the reality is, some people then have to go on to study other courses, such as what I did, the bar vocational course, which would cost you 16 grand. There was no grant available for that. You had to pay for that up front. And if you failed it, you had to start again and find another 16 grand. If I was in that position now, thinking 27,000 quid for the degree, the law degree, 16,000 on top, I'd be saying, I tell you what, I'm going to look for a job. That's the truth. So, sad but true. Puts people off, I think. Well, I, I think there's an element of that. It's important, though, that we don't put people off more than they should be, if that doesn't sound too uh, uh, clever by half. The, you, we've raised the amount you have to earn before you pay anything from 15,000 to 21,000. So hundreds of thousands of graduates, sad to relate, never earn 21 grand. So they don't actually pay anything back. If you get ill, you don't have to pay any money. If you get pregnant and you stop working, you don't have to pay any money. If after 30 years there's a debt left because you haven't paid it back, it's written off. It's debt, but not as you know it. It's not a normal debt, it's a tax. Effectively, it's a 9% tax on what you earn over 21 grand. So if you start, your starting job is, say, a teacher, like the uh, gentleman there who wants to be a sports teacher in secondary school, his first year will be earning 21,500, I think is about the starting point. You'll be paying less than £4 a month. By the time you earn £31,000 a year, you'll be paying £900 a year so that you could spend, if you took three years at university, being educated with additional funding by the state as well, um, you, you, the 27000 you would be paying that back at 900 a year on 31,000 earnings. Now, who should pay, if it's not you who's paying for it, who's going to pay for it? I'll tell you, I remember when I was at college, and I, it was the, when the grants were being got rid of, I, I went to uh, Selwyn College, Cambridge, right, nice college, and they were all going marching off. And I said, but when you, when you march down the street to oppose these cuts, you need to look about you. And they said, what are you talking about? So look for a run-down building, and see if you can see someone working in a run-down building. Because they'll be working on minimum wage or near as damn it, and you're marching so that you, with all the choices in the world at Cambridge University, can be subsidised by that person in that dead end job. They're going to work longer hours and pay more tax so that you can have a privileged education. 
And if you ask me, when you go into teaching, as I hope you do, and you're successful, and you move up and you're a senior teacher in your school, you'll be asked to pay 9% of what you earn over 21 grand. And compared to asking someone on minimum wage to work longer hours, who never really was very likely to go to university, to pay instead, I think the new system is fair, I think it's progressive, and anyone who thinks that universities for them should go and have no barrier whatsoever in the way. And we shouldn't have scaremongering. I think, I think, which sometimes we do I get think from, should, from uh, Labour suggesting should that somehow think about that people from poor a, homes, a come, people from poor homes I, I can't afford to go to university. Let's talk you can afford to go, were, and you should go. think it's very fair, Graham. Can application to universities for next year has fallen quite significantly as a result of people being put off by this 9,000 quid a year fee. So I respect the fact that Graham is doing his best to try and encourage people to go into university. I'll do well, the perhaps same. Perhaps you should do it as well. well. I do it. I do it. I think I started, Graham, with respect by saying I think anybody who wants to go down that line should be absolutely encouraged to do it. And it was the best thing that I ever did. <coughs> Coming from a, a working class background, it is extremely off-putting to people of moderate, moderate means to think about a debt of 27 grand plus something else on top. And that's without factoring in the fact that you've got to eat and go out and have a drink and have a bit of fun if you're at university. Effectively, it's a gradual tax. It's, gra it's effectively a gradual Could we tax. Just, we, we had a question. Could Somebody up there wants to ask a question. Could we have that and then we'll come back? Now he's explained it, I think more people want to go to university, and you just sound like you're putting people off. Do I? Yeah. I do apologise. <laughs> that was just, that was just being honest. Great, <laughs> great. Sorry, did you want to? Carry I was on. just saying you just got better. Sound like finished. Yeah. Um, great. Do you think it could be argued that the problem is that people aren't educated properly about the new system? Because people, it's like the point still stands. It's putting people off, but is that because they don't know? properly how the new system is going to work. Um, in some cases it's going, the new system will actually work out cheaper because people because you're paying back less each month. So do you think the problem is um, the fact that the education is not less around in the new system? Well, I, I don't want really to get into a big part of political ding dong. Uh, quite a lot of people in Carl's party have gone out and made out as if it's this 27 grand debt that uh, uh, like a burden around your neck, what would happen if something went wrong? The truth is, what happens if something, something goes wrong, like you lose your job, or you're sick, or you have a child, is you don't have to pay anything. That's what, they should be reassuring people, if it's right for you, you should go. The fact that people have to think about, this is, this is an expensive business going to university. Do I want to do it? Should I go and get a job? Well, for some people, some people were doing some pretty lousy degrees at pretty lousy uh, colleges, which didn't lead anywhere, and they were costing the state money and themselves money, and they weren't benefiting. I think a system in which you ask yourself seriously, what is the right course for me, is the right one. Um, and so I, I, if it puts off some people, it may be for the right reason. But you're quite right, I forgot to even mention that actually the payment every month now is lower than it was under the old system. So you pay less. If anything goes, you have to earn more before you pay anything anyway. And if anything goes wrong, you don't have to pay a thing. So if university is right for you, there are really no barriers and I would welcome it if the Labour Party stopped trying to scaremonger people for political purposes. The truth will get through, people will decide for themselves, and the other final point I'd make is notwithstanding the stuff about being from a poor home, you might be put off by the fear of debt, and there's an issue there, I mean, that's why it's important to, to reassure people today, but when you look at the statistics overall, who goes to university in general? It's the better off. So when, in fact, and that's not going to change, hopefully we'll get more people from lower income families going, but overall it's the better off we go to university. So when you argue for the general taxpayer to pay for university, you're asking for a subsidy for my friend in the dead-end job in the dead-end premises to pay more tax to subsidise the better off. That's not what I thought the Labour Party stood for, certainly not what I believe in, and I think we have a fair system, although it's, you know, it does mean that people have to pay more back when they earn it. Is there anybody else who wants to follow up from this with a point? Uh, yes, down the front, uh, who's got the microphone? Oh, okay, so a question um, from me first. To Graham, I don't know how you can say that £9,000 is easy for poor income families to pay, yet you're saying that everybody can go to university, but 27000 is a lot of money, and yet if they can't go to university, you say get a job, but there's no jobs available, so what is somebody supposed to do? 
Well, I, I, I wasn't trying to suggest it was little. I'm just saying that you don't have to pay anything on it. It's not like a normal debt. You take a normal debt out, you have to pay it back. Come what may. They're not really interested in your problems. You, you better have insurance if something goes wrong. If you haven't, you've got to pay it back. In this case, if you don't earn 21,000, you don't have to pay it back. You'll start working part-time three days a week. You earn less than 21 grand. You don't have to pay anything. At the end of 30 years, it's written off. It's important to get that over to people. It's still a lot of money there. You will, on 31,000 a year, if you get a job at 31 grand, you will have to pay 900 pounds a year. And 31,000 to you sounds like a lot. 900 of that doesn't sound such a lot. When you're living and you're paying your rent and you're paying all your own bills, 900 quid is a lot of money out of your disposable income. I'm not trying to minimize that. But it's from someone who's earning good money. It's not coming from someone who's struggling. It's not from coming from someone who's unemployed. It's actually there for those who've moved up, who've actually got somewhere in life because of the degree. Now, I don't see wherever you come from that if you've done well and you're earning the money, that you shouldn't contribute. What does it matter how pet poor your parents are? The important thing is how much are you earning and can you afford to pay? And a fair system is one in which asks the people who can afford to pay to pay and which protects those who can't. And that's exactly, in my view, what the system does. Nobody suggests, Graham, from my political party that that shouldn't be the position. The reality is, though, when a, you've got a government that's decided to scrap educational maintenance allowance for 16 to 18 year olds, many people in my constituency rely entirely on an EMA of, I think it was 30 quid a week, for them to go to college in the first place. And then, <laughs> Uh, produce a system which dictates that you need to spend 9,000 quid a year in a loan to get through a degree <coughs> is very off-putting. That's the reality to most people in my constituency. You might disagree with it, but it happens to be absolutely a fact. Okay, um, was there anybody else who wants to make points on that question at all? Oh, we've got, we've got a member of staff who wants to get involved. We all benefit from people with, um, with degrees, our doctors, our engineers. So that poor person that you're talking about who's having to pay for the degree for the better off person is also gaining some advantage. So as a, as a nation, if we want to compete with science and technology and with, with places like Germany, should we not be paying something in tax to help all young people have that opportunity. Well, I think that's a, a fair argument, but if you, if you think about it, that you could start applying to all sorts of things. We all benefit, most of the tax comes from um, the richest at highest earners, so perhaps we should subsidise them at an early age because um, they're going to do us so much good later. Maybe we should find other people who are powerful and strong and, and give them a bit more backing because we all benefit from their strength and power later on. I don't, I don't think that argument sounds superficially attractive. I don't think it bears out. It's basically, it's the privileged people in general who go to university. That's and any, and any, that's, that's how it works. Point, Overall, you look, at the, you look at the stats, that's, that's, that's and, and, and it isn't going to change. When we had free education, when we had free education, it wasn't different. If you appeal for more support for students, you're subsidising the rich. Expensive. Right, we're going to move on to the next question. If you do want to discuss... Can I just come back on that one point? Just, one more just point on no, the next question. question. If, if I don't do it, I'll uh, be extremely disappointed with myself on the drive home and, as Graham suggests, probably explode. Look, you know, it's true what you say. It is mainly more privileged people that go off to university. Um, but we should be encouraging everybody who, one, is on capable, and two, wants to do it, to go to university. And unfortunately, Graham, that student tuition fee puts people, like me, off doing it. That's the truth. Right, okay. We're going to move on to the next question now. Um, which is going to come from Rebecca Emerson, who studies English, Media and Psychology. Why should the visual impact be taken into account in the siting of wind farms when all supplies are running out and we desperately need the energy? Are we going to take this first? I'll have a go. Um, uh, it doesn't really feature so much for Carl, but I represent uh, the rural coastal area, Holderness, up to the coach coast and the people there who live there live there because they like the rural environment they choose to live there uh, don't like the fact that their community their <coughs> councillors everybody involved 
is opposed to having a wind, wind farm imposed on them, and yet it is imposed on them. And uh, I think visual impact is a key part of the planning process, and at the moment you have local people being made to feel as if their voice doesn't count at all about the very environment in which they live. And I just think that's wrong and, uh, and needs to change. Um, otherwise, if the government is going to decide that it doesn't care what anyone who lives locally thinks, that we need wind turbines so badly um, that they're just going to steamroll it, they shouldn't bother asking us our opinion. They should just get on and tell us that they're going to put them up and they don't give a damn what we think. Making us okay. can we spend move our time in meetings. We're, we're, we've we've only got time. five minutes left, and we've okay. still got quite a few questions to go through. So can we move on to Carl? I'll brief, be, uh, brief points uh, as on that. As quick quickly as I can, then. I think it's important that visual impact is taken into consideration, but I think you have to take other matters into consideration as well. Um, you know, I think it is important for people who are having to live in an area should be consulted and considered about what they think of some of them I think are extremely attractive to be perfectly honest they're very <coughs> aesthetically pleasing I think they're great but I suspect Graham who represents a constituency where you hear a lot of people complaining about wind farms it has a different view but but it is important you know if, you, if somebody's going to stick a wind farm outside of somebody's house you know they ought to be at least given the opportunity to complain if they think it's going to spoil their environment Okay, we're going to move straight on to the next question now because we've still got this and another one to go. Um, this is going to come from Chloe Chester, who is studying A levels in government and politics, classical civilization, communication and culture, and photography. Wow. To those of us who are thinking of a career in politics, can you share with us some of the recent highs and lows of being an MP? Yeah, I think the highs and lows probably came at the same time, to be perfectly honest. I was um, sat at home in my living room at about five in the morning after the general election, the night of the, or the morning of the uh, count, cracking open a, a bottle of champagne, if I'm honest, and um, suddenly realised, oh, I'm extremely happy. Gordon was going to have to move out of number 10 sometime soon. And for me, that was a massive disappointment. It was a high that I was elected as a Member of Parliament. It's a great privilege to be MP for East Hull, but the uh, wrong government, or the wrong two parties in government, as far as I'm concerned. OK, and on to Graham. Well, of course, the high point for me and for the whole nation was when Gordon Brown finally left number 10. Um, and we got rid of the most damaging promise we've had in a long time. But uh, in terms of high... What, you, the fascinating thing about politics is, as an MP is that you represent a relatively small area. So you have a personal relationship with a, a lot of people and the communities there. And you go and I run street surgeries in my towns and try to do that. Then you go to Parliament and you're there engaging with the sort of national issues. And then you can also get involved in influencing, sometimes participating in international things. So it's, yeah. it's absolutely fascinating going from, uh, I still find a romance to it that I'm in with and see on a Saturday morning. Uh, on a, uh, a wet winter's day, sitting there talking to someone who feels absolutely crushed. Mm. They, they feel that their, their complaints have been ignored, as if their family's needs have been ignored. And you can go back, and two days later, I'm in, in Parliament, literally able to just walk up to the Secretary of State for Health and tell him that he's quite wrong about what he's been saying. Absolutely. But the reality for the person in Withensee, that the single mum there is not what he says it is, yeah. and it needs to change. Uh, and the romantic, so although uh, I'm not saying our democracy is anything like perfect, but that link that it gives you from someone who's feeling utterly powerless and put upon mm. to being able to go to the most mighty people in the land and and tell them the the, re, the reality of it, I mm. think is a, a good thing. And we can bring those messages up and make a difference. So whether it's fighting for community hospitals, we get a new hospital in Beverly when they were all going to be shut, or trying to persuade the government, which we did successfully, working together cross party. We normally look like we're always fighting. But on the cross party, we worked together to get the Humber Bridge toll brought down, the debt brought down, because we had a bridge with 70% of its capacity unused, people unemployed on both sides, and it was ridiculous that it's not got down to a level where people can afford to cross it. So working together, we did some good. So overall, I still think being an MP is a fantastic job, Absolutely. and hopefully we do more good than harm. Good stuff. Right, do we have time for the last question? Very quickly. Yeah. Really good. Okay, this question is going to come from Danny Smith, who's currently studying extended diploma in sport and is a member of the England football squad for British colleges. Woo. Woo. So, what do you consider will be the legacy of the 2012 Olympics for your constituents? To start with, Carl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go then. No problem. Um, 
For me, um, Luke Campbell, who is, I'm told, likely to get a gold medal for boxing, would be a massive highlight. But I think just for the, you know, for everybody concerned, it's going to be a great feel-good factor. You know, the, the we've spent millions, billions on the uh, Olympics, and surely that's got to provide something for everybody. I know that the torch will be coming to Hull. I don't know if it will make its way to Beverly. Will it? It certainly will. Will it? I suspect with your, Another own, successful your campaign. influence. Yeah. It, it, it probably wouldn't have done unless Graham had have intervened, I suspect. But yeah, you know, that's going to be great. There's going to be kids from my constituency in East Hull queuing up in the town centre, excited about being involved in the Olympics. Great thing. Should make us all feel proud, I think. Absolutely. Well, I asked some people this morning, knowing that this question was coming, and, uh, and uh, they said the lasting legacy for your constituents is a debt. <laughs> that was a bit miserable. Um, I mean, it is expensive, but... Because uh, uh, he's asking like stories. Yeah. What, what we've got to do, and, and you know, and you know, that what, and, and all the sports students here know that what we've got to do is encourage people to participate in sport. It's a great way of bringing people together. Um, it's also good for health, and I hope the lasting legacy will be a, 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 an additional commitment to sport, the value it brings in bringing people together socially um, and keeping fit and enjoying themselves. Absolutely. Um, and if it can help in any indirect way to keep England top of the world test um, level at cricket, I'll be pleased. But it may be fairly indirect. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, we're going to wrap things up there then. Um, can we have a big round of applause for our two guests?